What happens when brilliant engineers are given too much freedom and not enough adult supervision? You get locomotives so absurdly complex, they became rolling monuments to the idea that simple solutions are for quitters. Today, we're counting down the 15 most over-engineered locomotives ever built. Starting in the 1880s, American railroads had a problem. Anthracite coal waste was dirt cheap, but nearly impossible to burn efficiently. The solution was a firebox so massive it could not fit between the wheels in the usual spot. So engineers did something bonkers. They perched the engineer's cab directly on top of the boiler, halfway down the locomotive, and the fireman was left alone on a tiny exposed platform at the rear, separated from the engineer by tons of steel and thundering machinery. Communication was reduced to shouting and banging on the boiler with hammers. The engineer sat inches above a roaring fire, with terrible visibility and heat that could cook a man slowly over an eight-hour shift. Injury records from the era show Camelback crews suffered twice the accident rate of standard engines. By 1927, the Interstate Commerce Commission banned new construction citing unacceptable risk. The Camelback proved that chasing fuel savings could twist a locomotive into something genuinely dangerous for the men who ran it. Number 14, the Bayer Garrett. This one looks like a locomotive that could not make up its mind. Two engine units sit at either end with the boiler and cab suspended in the middle floating above the rails. At first glance, it seems bizarre. But here is the thing. On the narrow, lightly built tracks of Africa and Australia, traditional steam engines sank bridges and buckled rails. The Garrett solved this by spreading its weight across two powered bogies, each carrying its own water and fuel. Instead of dragging a tender behind, the supplies rode directly under the driving wheels. In East Africa, the massive 59-class Garrett's hauled trains of over 2,000 tons across bridges that once struggled with half that weight. Crews described them as the engine that bends twice, able to snake through tight curves where rigid locomotives would stall. The flexible steam joints needed constant attention and the odd shape made them a handful on a rough track but for impossible geography. The Garrett turned the locomotive itself into the train, a brilliantly bizarre answer to problems nobody else could solve. Number 13, the Southern Pacific AC-12 Cab Forward. In the Sierra Nevada mountains, tunnels and snow sheds trapped locomotive smoke so thick that crews sometimes staggered out gasping for air. Southern Pacific's solution in the 1940s was radical. Flip the entire locomotive around, put the cab at the front, the exhaust at the rear, and let the crew breathe clean mountain air even while roaring through miles of darkness. This only worked because the AC-12 burned oil, not coal. Fuel could be piped from the tender at the back to the firebox up front. No shoveling required. Wartime records show these cab forwards hauled up to 7,000 tons over Donner Pass day after day, with reliability that kept supplies flowing to the Pacific. Old-timers called them backwards engines, and some refused to trust a locomotive that pulled with its tail. But for the men who ran them through choking tunnels, the AC-12 meant survival. Proof that sometimes the right way forward means flipping everything around. Number 12. The South African Class 25 Condensing Locomotive. Crossing the vast, dry heart of South Africa, steam locomotives faced an ancient problem, water. The answer arrived in the form of a machine that turned its own exhaust into a lifeline. Instead of wasting steam in thick clouds, these locomotives captured it, funneled it through a maze of radiator tubes, and cooled it back into water, ready to be used again. The result was a tender so massive and packed with machinery that it dwarfed the locomotive pulling it. Six steam-driven fans and more than two miles of radiator piping made the tender look less like a train car and more like a rolling factory. On a good day, the system could recover up to 90% of the water, stretching the range to nearly 500 miles between stops. But all that complexity came at a price. Radiator tubes clogged with scale, Fans demanded constant attention, and the sheer weight wore down the rails. Maintenance logs from the 1960s tell the story of crews battling fouled pipes and failing pumps, sometimes spending more time cleaning than running. Brilliant in theory, spectacular in person, exhausting in practice. Number 11. 
the LNERW-1, nicknamed Hush Hush. When the W-1 rolled out of British shops in 1929, it looked more like a submarine than a steam locomotive. Under its smooth, streamlined shell was the boldest experiment in British railway history, a water tube boiler borrowed from warships. Instead of a simple fire tube design, this engine used a maze of narrow pipes to withstand pressures up to 450 pounds per square inch. That is triple the pressure most locomotives operated at. Higher pressures meant more steam from less coal and the potential to leap ahead of every rival on the rails. Test runs were shrouded in mystery, with engineers sworn to silence and the press kept at bay. Diaries from the National Railway Museum tell of endless hours spent coaxing the boiler to behave fighting, scaling, and foaming that clogged the delicate tubes and threatened sudden failure? Maintenance crews dreaded every inspection. One missed deposit could trigger a cascade of leaks. Only one was ever built. The W-1, nicknamed Hush Hush, was a beautiful phantom haunted by the gap between radical ambition and the stubborn reality of steam. Number 10, the Pennsylvania Railroad T-1 Duplex. In the 1940s, the Pennsylvania Railroad wanted the fastest steam locomotive ever built. Designer Raymond Lowy gave them something that looked like a bullet and that ran like a dream when it worked. The T1 used a duplex drive, essentially two complete engine sets in one rigid frame, eliminating the pounding forces of traditional designs. On test runs, it hit 100 miles per hour with ease. Some engineers claimed speeds closer to 120 miles per hour. But here is where it gets truly bizarre. The T1 had a nasty habit of spinning its wheels at speed. All that power would suddenly break traction, and 6,500 horsepower would go from moving the train to polishing the rails. The poppet valve gear was so complex that maintenance shops nicknamed it the Nightmare. The Pennsylvania Railroad built 52 T1s between 1942 and 1946. Every single one was scrapped by 1953 because diesels were simply more reliable. The T1 was magnificent, terrifying, and a reminder that speed without dependability is just expensive excitement. Built by Alco between 1914 and 1916, the Erie Railroad's triplex was a mechanical dare that pushed steam power into the realm of the absurd. This 28882 behemoth had three sets of driving wheels, including one set tucked under the tender, 24 powered wheels clawed at the rails, all fed by a single boiler. On paper, it could generate a tractive effort of 120,000 pounds, enough to snap couplers and rip yard tracks apart. Crews quickly found out that was the easy part. The real challenge came when the triplex tried to move at anything faster than a crawl. The boiler simply could not keep up, starving the third engine set of steam and causing pressure to collapse above 15 miles per hour. Test data from Erie's own records show performance dropping off a cliff once the train left the yard. Yard workers nicknamed it the Yard Ripper because while it could drag a mountain of coal cars out of the terminal, it could barely make it to the next town. The triplex stands as a cautionary tale. Sometimes adding more power just means finding new ways to run out of steam. Number eight, the Bullard Leader. Post-war Britain was desperate to modernize and steam had to fight for its place on the rails. Enter the Bullard Leader, a locomotive that looked like a diesel and tried to act like one too. Oliver Bullard's vision was radical. It was a fully enclosed, double-ended machine, oil-fired and equipped with a mechanical stoker. The wheels and drive gear were boxed inside a metal shell, hidden from view and shielded from weather drive from either end and no need to turn the engine. In theory, this meant cleaner lines and easier operation. In reality, the leader was an oven. Heat built up inside the sealed body, filling the cab with stifling air and engine fumes. Crews sweated through shifts with poor visibility and almost no fresh air. Maintenance teams found themselves crawling through tight, greasy corridors to reach the wheel sets. Union minutes from 1950 are filled with complaints about working conditions and the near impossibility of keeping the machinery clean or cool. The leader ran a handful of test trains, but by 1951 the experiment was over. Every unit was scrapped. The leader proved that you could disguise a steam locomotive in diesel clothing, but you could not make it live like one. Number seven, the Pennsylvania Railroad S2. 
The S2 looked like something out of science fiction. A 123-foot-long machine sheathed in streamlined steel, driven not by pistons but by a direct-drive steam turbine. Built by Baldwin in 1944, the S2 was a bold attempt to bring jet-age technology to the rails, promising 6,900 horsepower and a ride smoother than any conventional steam engine. But here's the thing, turbines thrive on steady high-speed running. On the open mainline above 40 miles per hour, dynamometer logs show the S2 closing in on diesel-like efficiency, its turbines spinning at full song. The reality of freight railroading is far from constant. Trains crawl out of yards, stop for signals, and grind up grades. At these low speeds, the S2's turbine became a liability. Test data reveal a harsh truth. At 20 miles per hour, the S2 devoured coal and water two to three times faster than a standard locomotive. Engineers noted the difference instantly, eerily quiet at speed, but at a crawl, it was all steam and no go. It ran for just a few years before being sidelined, not for lack of vision, but because the railroad needed a locomotive that could do it all. Number six, the Chesapeake and Ohio M1 Steam Turbine Electric. The C and OM1 looked like a vision of the future, a long, low shell wrapped in smooth steel gliding across the rails with barely a sound. Under that streamlined body was a machine locked in battle with itself. A coal-fired boiler made steam, which spun two turbines and powered electric generators. Those generators fed traction motors on every axle. On paper, this promised the best of both worlds, the smooth pull of electric drive and the raw force of steam. Every mile revealed a new weakness. Coal dust and ash found their way into the turbines, coating blades, clogging passages, and grinding down delicate parts. Maintenance logs from the late 1940s read like a litany of frustration. Turbines fouled, generators ran hot, and traction motors tripped under heavy load. The M1's heat was relentless. Crew reports tell of electrical cabinets hot enough to scorch a hand and cooling fans that never seemed strong enough. The M1 ran for less than five years before the railroad gave up. A beautiful, expensive warning that even the most ambitious hybrid can be brought down by the simplest enemies, heat, dust, and the stubborn realities of coal-fired steam. In 1941, Union Pacific needed something monstrous to haul freight over the Wasatch Mountains. What they got was the largest steam locomotive ever built. The big boy stretched 132 feet from front to back and weighed 1.2 million pounds fully loaded. It had 24 driving wheels and 7,000 horsepower. Think about that. A machine weighing more than a Boeing 747 at maximum takeoff, powered by fire and water screaming through mountain passes at 70 miles per hour. The big boys used an articulated design with two separate engine sets that could pivot independently, letting them handle curves that would derail rigid locomotives of similar power. Alco built just 25 of them, and they worked the Sherman Hill route for two decades with remarkable reliability considering their complexity. Eight big boys survive today in museums, and Union Pacific famously restored Big Boy 4014 to operation in 2019. It was the biggest and arguably most successful over-engineered steam locomotive ever built. Proof that sometimes going absurdly large actually works. Number four the LNER P2, Cock of the North. When Britain's LNER needed power for the punishing Edinburgh to Aberdeen route in 1934, designer Nigel Gresley created the most powerful express passenger locomotive ever built in Britain. The P2 class had a 282 wheel arrangement, unusual for British passenger service, and featured rotary cam poppet valves that were state of the art. The P2 locomotives were so long and so powerful that they literally tore up the track. The rigid wheelbase fought the sharp curves of Scottish routes. Rail wear became a serious concern. The original streamlined casing trapped heat and made maintenance difficult. Only six were built, and by 1944 they had been rebuilt into conventional Pacifics under Edward Thompson's supervision. Gresley's masterpiece was effectively erased. Today, a group of enthusiasts is building a new P2 from scratch, determined to prove the concept could work with modern understanding. The original P2 locomotives were too much locomotive for their railway, a recurring theme in over-engineering. In 1946, 
French engineer André Chapelon completed what many consider the most efficient steam locomotive ever built. The 242A1 was rebuilt from an older locomotive using principles so advanced they seemed almost magical. Chapelon used triple expansion compounding where steam was used three times before being exhausted. He also designed streamlined steam passages that eliminated wasteful pressure drops. The result was a locomotive that produced 5,500 horsepower while using less fuel than machines half as powerful. On test runs, the 242A1 achieved a thermal efficiency of around 12%. That does not sound impressive until you realize most steam locomotives manage 6% at best. Chapelon had nearly doubled the efficiency of steam power. But here is the tragedy. Only one was ever built. The French National Railway was committed to electrification and saw no future in steam. No matter how brilliant, the 242A1 was scrapped in 1960. It was the most efficient steam locomotive ever constructed and it was destroyed because it arrived too late. Chapelon's work influenced steam design worldwide, but his masterpiece exists only in photographs and engineering diagrams. Number two, the Soviet P-38. The Soviet Union did not do anything small, including mistakes. In 1954, they built the P-38, a massive 484 steam prototype with a mechanical stoker, roller bearings throughout, and a boiler pressure of 213 pounds per square inch. The Soviets intended it to be the definitive Soviet steam locomotive, powerful enough to haul the heaviest trains across endless Russian distances. They built exactly one. Testing revealed problems that could not be economically solved. The complexity that was supposed to make it superior made it a maintenance nightmare. Soviet railways were already transitioning to diesel and electric power. The P-38 was scrapped after minimal service, a victim of timing as much as engineering. It represents the final gasp of Soviet steam ambition. A locomotive designed to be the best that arrived just as steam became obsolete. The Soviets had built the future of the past. Number one, the Norfolk and Western John Henry. And here it is, the strangest, most ambitious, and most completely doomed locomotive ever built. The John Henry stretched nearly 161 feet from end to end, wrapped in a boxy shell that looked nothing like its steam ancestors. Underneath was a gamble no other railroad dared attempt. A coal-fired steam generator fed a direct drive turbine that powered electric traction motors on every axle. Norfolk and Western believed they could combine the smooth power of turbines, the flexibility of electric drive, and the cheap energy of coal into one unstoppable machine. In practice, they created a rolling laboratory for every problem steam technology could not solve. Coal dust and ash crept into turbine blades and generator windings grinding down delicate parts. Maintenance diaries from Roanoke shops are filled with notes about clogged filters, burnt-out motors, and turbine failures that stranded the engine miles from help. The controls were a maze of switches and gauges, more airplane cockpit than locomotive cab. Every trip was a test run, every mile a risk. Despite its size and promise, the John Henry spent more time in the shop than on the rails. In less than three years, it was retired, not beaten by competition, but by its own complexity. When it failed, it did not just close the book on bizarre steam locomotives, it drew the curtain on a century of coal, fire, and ambition. The John Henry was the final towering statement of faith in steam power. Its failure made clear that the age of steam was truly over. And that's all, folks. 15 locomotives that prove innovation often looks absurd before it changes the world or fails spectacularly trying. Don't forget to subscribe. Here's another video I've specially selected for you. See you next time.